Educated Economist. Got special guest Freddie with me today. Hello. Hello, yeah. Freddie actually did a really good job reading the Bloomberg article on the manufacturers. What did we find out in that article, Fred? What's going on? You remember you read it? You remember some of the details you read? No. No? Yeah, you read it out loud. Well, we found out that manufacturing has slowed dramatically over the course of the last two years, or considering what was taking place two years ago, it's the slowest that it has been since then. So that was like right in the middle of the pandemic when everybody was told to stay home and not go to work and do all that other stuff, um, or not do all that other stuff. And what we ended up with was a slowdown in manufacturing. Well, then there was a huge ramp up in manufacturing. Well, we're starting to find the signs of it slowing down again. And are you gonna start reading some of the comments? <laughs> Good evening. So anyway, I'm having a feeling that this is part of the uh, Cantillon effect and a lot of that has to do with this overwhelming consumer demand that just simply didn't exist at the time. Um, and that overwhelming consumer demand sent the manufacturers into over overproduction, essentially. And now we're finding out that all this production really wasn't 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 in demand. I mean, it was like a false demand that was taking place. So here we have high inventory surplus taking place at places like Walmart and, and Target. But then also, if you read some of the articles, you can find that there's a backlog of stuff over in Europe that needs to come to the United States. And they're really having troubles getting it here and not that we really even want it. Maybe the car part of things, you know, the cars and the car uh, parts. But all the furniture, all that other stuff that is destined for us, we're really not in need of it. And we're already oversupplied, so we're about ready to get hit with even more supply coming from Europe, you know, after we get all this stuff from China. So here the United States is going to be loaded with stuff. And I think of this as like the can of the Cantillon effect, or like a lot of people will call it can Cantillon. Um, but he was a French guy, and his name was pronounced Cantillon. But this is really where, like... I think a lot of people are kind of misinterpreting like what's going on in the economy because that Cantillon effect, I mean, it's like a one-way street. It's going to happen. And what we find is that when new money comes into the system, the people who have first access to that money, they get to spend it at face value. But as that money enters into the system, what ends up happening is it starts driving up the prices of everything. So the people at the very end of the line who have last access to the money, they're the ones who suffer the most with it, with their wages pretty much being the same, but <laughs> you like making faces at the camera and yeah. with their, <laughs> I'm reading the are comments. you reading the comments? Yeah. yeah. And, um, so they're the ones who suffer the most with it as they have to pay the higher price, but their wages haven't gone up. Well, what, what a lot of people that's where usually people kind of end the Cantillon effect they really don't go on to explain it any further but really it goes much deeper than that because what Cantillon goes on to explain is is that if this continues this new money continues to pour into the system the people who have first access to that money they don't want to spend it on higher priced goods they want to get it at face value so what ends up happening is, is you start driving in a lot of foreign imports coming in hey right on there's a super chat right on and look that's for you buddy ice cream for freddy you got it man ten dollars for it thank you very much for the super chat there orlando thank you very much so as the people are looking or the the people who have access to this money as they're looking to acquire some of the products and stuff at the same face value as they once enjoyed purchasing those things at, they seek out that foreign foreign trade so if the domestic manufacturers are charging too much or have it at a high price because of this new money coming into the system they will start searching out that foreign imports well that's what we're starting to see well the more this happens the more the money starts pouring into the system the ever increasing amounts of foreign imports come in and it slows the domestic manufacturers until the point that the domestic manufacturing almost ceases to exist and you're reliant on nothing but foreign imports that can continue until the money gets cut off and everybody goes into poverty. But this is where we're starting to see the, the, the issues. I mean, think about all this foreign trade that has come into the United States and the slowdown in the manufacturers that are also taking place here in the United States. Once the money turns off, once the money becomes too expensive to borrow anymore, then we're going to start seeing issues with people falling into poverty. And I fear that's probably what's going to end up happening. As food and fuel gets more expensive and the income start to diminish because people are going to start losing their jobs as the zombie corporations get their heads knocked off, 
that's going to create a situation here in the United States where people I just don't think are ready to or ready or prepared to handle. Hey, thank you, Jaws, for the uh, four ninety nine. Happy Fourth of July to you, E and Freddie. Thank you very much, Jaws. I really appreciate that. You're very generous. You've always has been. So this is where we're starting to find it. Now, take a look down in the description. There's all kinds of articles that are talking about this. And just recently, I think today, I don't think I have a link down in the description for this one, but GDP now coming from the Federal Reserve is showing signs that we are in a recession. Now, a lot of people have been calling this for quite some time, but really, all right, a 499 super sticker from January Carter. Thank you so much. So a lot of people were calling this recession a while ago, but you have to have two quarters of negative growth in order to call it a recession. But by the time you call it a recession, you have already been in it for six months. So it's pretty pretty well showing itself that we are in a recession at this time. And I think those links down in the description are really starting to prove itself. The other question is, is have in, has inflation peaked? Well, Think about the expansion of money and credit. How many car loans, how many house loans, how many credit cards, how many people are taking on debt right now? And that is really a sign of slowing down because there's less of that taking place. And that's the expansion of money and credit. So yes, prices are high. They're probably gonna remain high for a while. We're gonna find things that are gonna still be elevated going into the future. However, think about some of these things that are not needed but wanted like furniture, and TVs and stuff like that. I mean, Freddie, you've been signing, finding some really cheap TVs out there, haven't you? Yes, I saw a 100 inch or a 103 inch for what was it, seven hundred dollars? Seven hundred dollars. It was something like that. It's and it was a nice quality. I can't remember which one it was, but it was one of the higher quality TVs, and I thought that was a pretty good deal. Yeah. I but we we don't need a hundred and three inch TV or whatever it was. No, that's our entire wall. Well, that was an entire wall. That's right. But that's some of the things we're finding. So what's going on out there? By the time Freddie graduates, he will be educated economist. Yes, he will. Yeah. This kid is learning it good. What were we talking about earlier? We are talking about gold, huh? Yeah. What was the point of holding gold? That you can't trust the bank with it because uh, I saw on Facebook like two or three days ago a bank got lobbed. Right. Got robbed. Yeah, here in Astoria, a bank got robbed, right? So you can't trust the banks, but that money's insured. But what happens if a bunch of banks go bankrupt? Will you get your money? No. Or, yeah, you could possibly lose your money. And that's the reason why you need gold, right? Mm hmm Okay, so what is gold? Gold is a physical item in your hand. Yes. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's pretty good to have. That was the other thing. Go take a look at the um, one of the last links I think I have in the description. The Bureau of... Bureau of you know, you guys know I can't talk. The Bureau of International Settlements has now allowed or is now allowing Bitcoin to be, what was it, 1% of the reserves as a tier one asset, I think, which is just incredible to hear. So, I mean, golden, I mean, you guys know me. I like cash, gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Those are my like three places to go as far as, as, far as the savings goes. Let's see, we got to have some questions going on here. That's gold smart kid. Yes, he is. Hi, Simon. Your thoughts on recent rebel capitalists? The rebel capital is a lot of fun. I got my hat on today, my end the Fed hat. I got um, one. Yeah, and Freddie's wearing the uneducated economist hat. Let's fix that back there. The rebel capitalist event was an, was an amazing time. Um, we, I saw most of the speakers um, and really like the main takeaway that I had really taken from like these speakers is one you got to get prepared you got to get prepared for shortages of food and fuel that was like a major concern um and they like a lot of them are setting up their like not everybody's going to be able to you know have a 40 acre ranch or a 12 acre ranch or even have any kind of ranch so although that was what a lot of talk was is about like having property that can be self-sustaining it's it's just because you can't have that property doesn't mean that you can't prepare for for the issues that are going to come networking with people was the other big thing that was probably like the biggest like those two were like the biggest issues be prepared and network with people and then also like the second day with brent johnson and steve Van meter and jeff snyder and everybody i mean although it's hard to like grasp the idea of it but a strong dollar is coming and you can see it like and it's not so much like obvious here in the United States. It's obvious outside of the United States. The dollar is getting much stronger outside 
of the United States compared to the basket of world currencies out there. So that was kind of like my takeaway from it. The event itself is just amazing. The energy that you feel in this place is just so incredible. People are excited, they're positive, they love sharing their thoughts, their ideas, their you know success that they've had, the confusion that they have. They love talking about all this stuff. And the Rebel Capitalist, I mean, it's like hanging out with a bunch of friends, like a big group of friends. Everybody is super awesome there. All right, should, oops, let me see. Should I refi and buy an Escalade? Use the Escalade on Turo for a profit. Um, I don't know, man. If you can figure out how to make an Escalade make you money, I say go for it. I mean, you want to go ahead and scan up. Oh, let's see. A funny fact. The opposite trade would be just that. Oops. The dollar will fail. Will fall. Yeah. Um, buy an Escalade. You need a bottomy. Is that what it said? <laughs> here, just kind of scroll with me up. There you go. Um, oops. Moving a little too fast there. Here, slow it down. What was that one up here? But foreign governments are going to default. Have you looked at the Bank of Japan and their bonds? UAE are about to sign a contract in Yuan for oil. Actually, that's starting to happen right now. In fact, I was reading an article of how India and Russia had done a deal in Yuan. Like, it didn't even have anything to do with their currency. They went to China, use their currency to make the deal. Now, everybody says, well, there's a sign of it. There's a sign of the United States or the dollar losing its world reserve status or starting to. And... I kind of disagree with that. I think that probably has more to do with sanctions and the denial of payment using the US dollar. So they had to use something else. And since Russia and China are big into doing deals with each other, I'm sure Russia would be more than happy to take you on. Ultimately, the rest of the world, they want dollars. But if you're being sanctioned, if you have issues using the dollar because you're Russia, then yeah, I could see where India would want to make a deal with Russia using you on. Yeah, you see another... Let's see, everybody is just going for the dollar. A shift will come. Is everybody just going for the dollar? I mean, it seems there's so much talk out there about, you know, how everybody hates the dollar. It's hard to believe that anybody would be stashing it. I mean, I'm stashing dollars, but, you know. Got grandkids on the job today. Best investment of the planet, family. Yep, that's for sure. So, oops, go ahead and scan it up there, Fredders. Let's see. Why are lumber futures up last two days? Well, okay, that's a good question. Um, so when you have a situation like we're having with lumber right now, the prices were falling, falling, falling. The idea of buying into the lumber as the prices are coming down is like, you know, kind of a scary, you know, position to be in. If you end up on a lot of expensive lumber, you either have to take a loss or, you know, sit on it with high prices. So the people who buy lumber, they're going to try and buy it at the lowest or if they think it's going to be moving up. Here's the thing. There has been such an inventory depletion taking place. Everybody has let their inventory go down. So when they're trying to fill that inventory, they're going to buy up, right? And especially if they think it's going to go, go much higher. The average price for lumber is going to be higher than it ever was. I'm thinking the channel is going to be somewhere between six and 800 per thousand. So anything like under 700 seems like it's a pretty good deal. And I understand why people would want to load up on it. But here's the thing. There's a manufacturing slowdown. Hmm. There's a manufacturing slowdown taking place within the lumber industry. And in fact, I was, um, I didn't leave a link to it, but if you go and look at Madison, I think it's Madison lumber or something. I, I can't remember. But she does a great job with her videos. And uh, she was talking about it, I believe, in her last video about how there is curtailments happening throughout the lumber industry. So as they, can, as they curtail development and tighten up that inventory, prices are going to shoot up. Here's the thing. Once it gets over 800 per thousand, the mills fire up again because they want to take advantage of those higher prices. So I don't know if that kind of helped as far as like trying to understand what's going on with the lumber. But if you go and look at like how many housing starts are taking place as opposed to how much had taken place, you know, say during, you know, the last five years, there is a lot of demand, but there's not going into the retail. So it's like there is demand for homes and building homes, but that's not only those aren't the only people who who buy lumber. I mean, there's a huge retail market and that is pretty much dead. One of the anecdotal evidences, an adding, oh geez, 
I can't talk. One of the one of the views that I am seeing when I talk to some of my vendors is that um, <clears throat> what does that say? Poor kid hear about economics every day. Yeah, he does. Um, but he has to be out here, right? <laughs> Um, one of the, uh, one of the evidence that I'm hearing, at least from one of my vendors is the pressure treated. And he was talking about how there was a dramatic slowdown in how much they are pushing out. He said last year at the peak, they were pu putting out like, I, they go by poundage. So he said they were pushing out over a million pounds a day. And he said now it's like seven or 800 per or seven or seven or 800,000 pounds. So it's a dramatic drop in the amount of pressure treated moving out there. And you have to think that's plate stock. Those are decks. Those are fences. Those are all the like outdoor projects that are happening, which is a huge sign in the retail market. At least that's a sign for me in the retail market. Hey, Freddie, learn from your dad. He is smart. Well, we'll, we'll figure that out. Maybe um, they want you to honk the horn. The car, yeah. The car's not even on. That's okay. You can hit it. Uh, are you? Oh, uh, maybe it doesn't. No, it doesn't work. I didn't know that. Huh. Uh, let's see. What's the next question? Are you long bull single family homes? You know, that's gonna be um, it's gonna be a tough one to answer because I had, I was very much under the belief that we were going to have a housing market crash prior to the pandemic. But when the pandemic kicked in and all the stimulus packages came out and they pretty much papered over all the foreclosures and evictions that would have happened, that saved the housing market. That was not something I was expecting. So I don't I can't call out the housing market. I'm not going to anymore because the things that are seem logical don't don't play out. Right. Because things aren't logical anymore. So when it comes to like calling out the housing market, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to even attempt to try. I see house prices falling all over the place. My house that, that I purchased, it goes up. I mean, it continues to go up in price. So I haven't seen it gone. I haven't seen it go the other way yet. Once it does, I might, you know, might say then, okay, hey man, we're having a downturn in the housing prices, but mine, mine still seems to go. Um, the other thing you have to think about is like what would cause you know, a housing downturn to take place. And it would pretty much be a huge increase in the amount of inventory out there. And even if we had doubled the inventory right now, it still wouldn't be very high. It's still like a very tight market considering the availability of homes. It is increasing, it is going that direction, but is it like anything significant to say that, hey, we're gonna see a significant downturn? I don't see it yet. So. Go ahead and read a question there, Freddie. What do you find? Prices in my area don't seem to be a Affected or affected, affected that much right now. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Go ahead and find another comment. Who's the little dude? The little dude is my son. This is Freddie. Um, what is it? Housing outside Charlotte, North Carolina are starting to sit on the market longer. Yeah, that's what we're finding as well. Uh, let's see. Go ahead and grab another question there, Freddie. I'm gonna go up a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Go back up there and find one. Did we miss a super chat? Hey man, cool. Look at these two having fun. <laughs> Dude, 99.8 thousand subscribers. Yeah, we're getting really close. We're almost to that 100,000 mark. And what do we get when we hit the 100,000, Freddy? Uh, silver play button. Yeah, a silver play button. I haven't seen it, but Freddy was showing it to me. So what does it look like? Uh, it's basically a YouTube plaque that's all silver. And on the back it has a name and Congratulations for hitting 100,000 subscribers. Very cool. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. Freddie's really excited about seeing it, too. Did we miss a super chat up there somewhere? Scan down to see what the last super chat was. No, I mean the other way. Oh, well, that's good. Sorry if I missed the super chat, guys. I see that there was a little bit up there, but I'm not. Okay. Hit the like button, y'all. Yeah, I really appreciate it. That would be that would be very cool of you guys. What it does is it sends the algorithm out there to start bringing more people into the chat so we can have more uh, more people commenting, which makes it a lot, lot more fun. Glad Freddy looks like his mom. Yeah, he does. He does look like a lot like his mom. All right. right. Bond market is crazy. Yeah, it sure is. What did we learn about bonds, Freddy? What was the... Uh, what was the tenure today? Do you remember? Uh, wasn't the tenure like six point? Oh wait. That was what? It was six point five oh three. I'm that sure. was, but that wasn't the bonds. That was the. 
10 year. No, that, the 10 year was less than that. The mortgage market. Oh, mortgage. Oh, you're talking about, oh, the well, the arm, the adjustable. We were learning about mortgages earlier today. Um, but yeah, the the 30 year mortgage was what? Six and a half and the 15 was what? Five something? Nice to see you. Big love from, what is that, Croatia? Right on. Very cool seeing Croatia up in here. Michael Burry is not right about the Fed stopping taper. They need some inflation to monetize the debt deficit. Um, yeah, I have a feeling that they are going to tighten up this money supply. They're going to tighten up the available credit. They're going to start causing a lot of pain to the people who have overextended themselves on credit. And they're going to start passing some things into the uh, into the economy, like central bank digital currencies. I have a feeling that that's going to come with the next crisis, and it could be a manufactured one just simply by tightening up the uh, the money supply and raising the interest rates. And yeah, go ahead and find another question there, Freddie. Yeah, we got to read them so we don't have dead air. We're going to be building a new home one to two years, and are worried about cost and declining market gotta do what you got to do well at some point you do have to just you know I mean if you need a house if you need a place to live and you're planning on building a project at some point you do have to just kind of go for it um, I think if you're looking to frame the place right now then it's probably a pretty good uh, pretty good time to pick up your framing lumber Dinosaurs are gold. 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 <laughs> Dinosaurs are gold. gold. Yeah, let's go find some of their most recent who is the little fella? Lord Humongous, this is my son, Freddie, who is really picking up the economics pretty good. He read a Bloomberg article on the way in today about manufacturing. He did a great job of it. In fact, it was the article we have down in the description. Freddie, what's something you are enjoying spending money on? A food, perhaps? What's uh, you, what do you like to buy, Freddie? Uh, well, what do you do with your money? I mostly save it, but like, if we go to a mall and I want to buy something, I usually buy, like, Pokemon or something. Yeah, you like the Pokemon cards, don't you? Yes, I have a tin that can't even close. Yeah, you got so many Pokemon cards. Uh, I do have a binder full of a lot of gold and metal cards, though. Yeah, those are your favorite ones? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice nice half <laughs> It's because I did this. Fuzzy dice are showing one and... What is that? Showing 12. Oh, yeah, it sure is. Cute boy, thank you. The trading desk at the Fed was busy today. Yeah, I bet. Um, I can't imagine what like people must be like thinking right now as far as like what it is that they should be positioning themselves into. There has been so much talk about inflation. It's hard to believe that you know anybody would like. It's hard to believe that. <laughs> Look at their. It's hard to believe that anybody with all the inflation expectation that's going on out there to try and understand what the strong dollar is going to be. But that's really how I have been for quite some time. I have, you know, really I felt that the strong dollar has really pretty much always been there. But they hammered it with all the quantitative easing and then the severing of the supply chain, which is like just destroyed the economy and kind of covered up what would have been a huge deflationary spiral. But instead, what ended up happening is, is that they printed out all this money, supposedly pushed that into the economy. But really, if you kind of understand how the quantitative easing works, it ends up mostly on the big bank's balance sheet and really doesn't enter the economy until it is lent into existence. All the stimulus that went into the economy, that's more of like the saws and beers analogy that I use. Like if you take out a bunch of debt, and you buy beer with it, you can stimulate the economy. I mean, you can, you know, you think about it, there's a lot of stuff that goes into beer. You got manufacturing, agriculture, advertising, transportation. There's a lot of stuff that goes into beer that could really like stimulate the economy if you printed up a bunch of money and just started buying beer. The only problem is, is that once you have drank the beer, it's all gone. Now you got to postpone your current spending to pay for that past consumption. And that's really where like the economy has, is heading. Because when we did the stimulus package, it didn't go into buying saws. Because if you had bought in saws, then you could cut up a bunch of lumber, fasten that together, sell whatever product that you have. So if you can imagine everything in the economy either in a, either being a beer or a saw, the stimulus went into beers and not into saws. So if it had gone into production and manufacturing, 
we may be able to manufacture, pay off our debts, you know, move into a stronger economy, but we didn't do that. We went into buying beer and now we got to postpone our current spending or yeah, our current spending to pay for that past consumption plus the interest. With low interest rates, there's very little return on capital and that in in turn also slows the economy down. So we're heading into contraction. I mean, it's happening. I you know, I don't see like the hyperinflation scenario. I don't know how that's. I don't. I don't see that taking place at all. Wow. Fifty dollars. What is that? 50. Who from Boris? Uh, put your money where your mouth are. Love the channel. Yeah, that's that's it. I mean, I I've said it for a long time. Pretty much since I started the channel, that I put my money towards cash, gold, silver, and Bitcoin, and. Right now, with the BIS, you know, the Bureau of International Settlements allowing Bitcoin to be one of their tier one assets, or at least at least that's what I got from the article. I might got might have read that wrong, but one percent of reserves can be held in Bitcoin by these big banks. Hell yeah, man! I mean, that's like I'm in. I'm I'm like I'm confident in Bitcoin now. Oh wait, you tried to send something, but you just typed in chat. What's that? Six ninety two. He he tried oh. to. Uh, so some oh, is that what? <laughs> oh. You can uh, you can charge a Tesla with a few PV panels. Yeah, that's like a smart way to go about it. You think about it. You don't even have to have fuel. You can just charge your car up with the sunlight. That would be awesome. Of course, here in Oregon, I don't know how well that would work. Those big banks are insolvent. Yeah, they're going to be. Again, Lord Humongous is a huge gold fan, so we're we're gonna have a hard time convincing them of anything other than gold. But I totally understand because. And that's the position that I'd rather be in than having any kind of stocks or bonds or anything like that. I would much rather be in gold or silver. All right. You have a possible recession. Oops, what was that? Let's go back up there a little bit. You have a possible recession, but against that, you have supply shocks due to the Russia thing. Like, Russia makes 50% of the world's palladium. So that makes the inflation situation a little less clear. Well, that's for sure. You know, I mean, one of the things that we've been hearing about is how there's this horrible wheat supply. But I was just reading how Russia is pumping out more wheat out of out of their country right now than just about any time. So, like, the low wheat supply is is awesome for Russia, right? I mean, they're loving that. All right. What about the oil, TE? Um the oil tea. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Let's see. Simon, I'm in I'm in Austin. Our commercial asset classes are still moving fast. SFR property is still high and days on the market has extended just a bit. Still less than six months inventory. Yeah, and see, that's what I'm talking about. Even if you were to, like, really increase the inventory levels, even if you were to double it, there's still, like, it's, there's not that much supply out there. And until that, like, supply gets really significant, I just don't know how the house pro housing prices are going to come down. You know, even with, even with the interest rates as high as they are, I mean, I hate to say this, but people will sign a deal on anything. As long as they're approved for it, they'll sign it, and even if it takes them to the extent of their of their capabilities. So. All right. Oil reserves. How long? You know, I don't know. If you listen to, like, guys like Chris Martinson, it's not very long. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end here real soon. But I don't know. I end up, I end up finding, like, thinking that once it gets to a certain point, that it's just like, hey, this is going to be a real problem and going to be devastating. They find alternatives like, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And so, like, you know, things things change. Um, you know, I mean, not that it's like any kind of like relief to the energy crisis or out there or crisis out there. But there's like I mean, I was reading articles and learning about how mushrooms one you, they make mushrooms that can produce diesel, like a, an equivalent to diesel. And then they have another one that can eat oil. So, I mean, you think about this, like, nobody really thinks about, like, these alternative possibilities out there and how to expand them. You know, an another thing, like, people really don't talk about, and I was going to do a video on this, and I'll probably do a little bit more research before I really dive into it. But one of the things that a lot of people aren't, con aren't considering as far as a new building 
technique going into the future is the cross laminated timber industry and this is pretty much where they build high rises out of wood which seems so like oh my gosh this, why would anybody do that but it has a lot of advantages i mean not that i really am big into the whole green movement or anything but it's a green product supposedly and then it's rot proof bug proof uh you know fireproof has better seismic qualities to it and as far as like the actual construction of the building, it's not really intrusive on the surrounding areas because the pieces are pretty much manufactured someplace else and then brought in and just put into place. So even the manufacturing of these buildings is a lot more like environmentally friendly just for the, you know, just for being in that area and not, and less disruptive. <laughs> Here, flip it around. <laughs> so that's one of the things that I, I think a lot of people aren't really considering when it comes to like what's going to happen here in the economy with the new with the with like building and apartment complexes, high rises, stuff like that. Hardly hear anybody ever talk about the cross laminated timber industry. Do I buy silver? Uh, no, but I do have a piece at home. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was it? Um, we got that. It was some of the uh, beast. What was the image on it? I can't remember. Uh, there what I have two. One's my brother's. One um, pushes a horse, and one is a lion. I have the lion. And you have the lion one, and those were the queen's beasts. Those were those are really cool coins. Oh, right, a two dollars super sticker from what is that makeshift from... player? Right on. I'm from California. It's been overbuilt and overpriced for decades. For decades? Yeah, that's Lord Humongous. Huh? What's that question right there? Where's that one said? What's your inflation in construction in this U.S. year to year? What is the inflation in construction in U.S. year to year? Um, I'm not sure what the how the question is. Like, what's the price increases on homes? It's <laughs> incredible i mean i couldn't even tell you like how much has gone up in two years but i know some people's houses have doubled since then which doesn't make any sense and of course other areas didn't really move at all i mean a friend of mine bought a house in missouri for like less than forty thousand dollars and it's not the greatest house in the world but it's something you could live in and i mean for forty thousand that doesn't seem like it's too much money i mean it's hard to believe there's even a house in, that even exists like that but of course, he's in Missouri. I don't know how awesome Missouri is, but anyway. There will be a board M that's, MKT that's decline. Market. There'll be a broad market decline. Meaning no safe harbor and bonds. Oh, wow. What? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, oh. scan it down and read the rest of the question there. Yeah, so what was that? Bonds, whenever someone is shorting banks may do well or more likely go broke the banks i can put in but with rates up they will make more banks are complaining but with rates up they will make more that's right so as the interest rates begin to rise the return on capital increases and that actually is stronger for the economy so encodes thank you so much for the 20 dollars super chat what does that say in there read about the mushroom root mushroom mycelium Mycelium used to packing for material the other day for for Freddie would do you do one million if if you won the lottery tomorrow happy fourth guys cheers from St Paul Min Minnesota yeah so what would you do with a million dollars Fredders that's uh, a lot of money how much what would you do with a million probably save it or buy silver or gold or save it. Yeah, you wouldn't buy a house, or you wouldn't do something like that. My house is fine. You like our house? Would you pay our house off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what else would you do if you didn't? If besides saving it or buying gold and silver, would be there, would there be anything else that you could think of that you might do with it? Or is that it? That's like you just don't feel confident in anything else. Would you buy stocks like pieces of the companies? Would you buy a bunch of Pokemon cards? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no you wouldn't buy Pokemon. <laughs> I I don't I don't know why I I I I just like to save. You like to save. 
Yeah, he does. He likes to save. He has more money than his brother does. His brother likes to buy, likes to spend his money, but Freddie likes to save his. Um, I am pretty sure since I spent ten dollars on really cool headphones, and I gave my mom two dollars to buy bicycle things to for my bike. Oh, okay. Yeah, you bought pieces for your bike. At a garage sale, and I had some some dollars and so. <laughs> I have sixty-five dollars. You got sixty-five dollars at left out of the uh, out of the money that you had gotten. Pokemon cards can go for it. outrageous prices here. Well, yeah, I um at a place I saw a Pokemon card. It was a light shoe for four hundred dollars. Wow, I don't know anything about Pokemon cards. I do. Yeah, I know you got a lot of them. Here, scroll up. Let's find another comment. Uh. My daughter saves her money. She is eight. Yeah. So just like you, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Let's see. Love. Oop, go back down there a little bit. Love. Love you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mop Top. That's very cool. All right. I need high interest rates to survive on fixed income. The higher the inflation rate, the better. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily higher the inflation rate. I think it's just higher the interest rates would, would benefit you. Um, but, yeah, if you could get a better return on your capital investment, I mean, that's really where it comes down to. It's just like when you have interest rates as low as they are, think about it like this. If you had a million dollars, like, okay, Freddie in, inherits that million dollars. If he had that million dollars back in 1980, like, of course, he wasn't born yet. And, but if you lived back in 1980 and he had a million dollars, he would be able to... To loan that money to the government by buying what? You remember we were talking about it? Bonds. Bonds, that's right. So you could buy bonds. And if you bought like 10-year treasuries back in the early 80s, they were paying like anywhere from 10 to 15% yield. So you could take home 100000 $150,000 a year. That was a pretty good return on a million-dollar investment with the, with the United States government. Nowadays... You put it in with the government, and you're going to get what? Less than thirty thousand dollars. So that's not much of a living for a million dollar investment with the government. So that's the slowdown in capital investment. That's the less less return on capital investment. That slows down the economy. I mean, back in the early '80s, you could spend one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Now you're only going to get thirty thousand dollars a year to spend. So yeah, low interest rates actually slows the economy down, and higher interest rates is stronger for the economy. How much cash to keep at your house in case someone major happens, something major happens? I hardly, it's, keeping cash on hand is, is a dangerous place to go with it, right? So I keep most of my cash at the bank and it's not like I want it to be at the bank, but it's the safest place that I fear, feel that I can keep it. When it comes to silver, I spread that into many locations because, again, it only takes one thievery and it's all gone. So putting everything in one spot is is going to be like you're asking for it at that point. So especially especially if you, people know you have it. So, you know, spreading it into many locations, that's the big thing. And it's hard because at that point now you have to go back into trust again. You have to trust that that either family or friends or somebody. Five dollars. Hey, for Freddie. Freddie's savings. Yui, spot me the penny to make the five dollars. You got it. Yui, do you see things like windows, appliances, cabinets coming down in price for Reno? Um, appliances, yes. I see appliances coming into the into the country faster than they did, which is going to bring the availability up. And the prices should stabilize on those. It won't be nearly as expensive or have such long lead times. Windows, they're still out two months. Like the last ones that I ordered are two months away, which is, you know, which is going to be very difficult as far as completing homes, especially if you have an issue like, you know, windows were ordered incorrectly or, you know, something got damaged. Now you're like set back two months and that's like devastating when it comes to, a house that you're trying to profit from. I mean, if it's your own personal house that you're working on and you know you have time to work on it, then you know, waiting on a broken window not a big deal. But if you you know, time is money and you're planning on getting this thing like 
enclosed and finished and all that and you have to wait on a window for two months that's that's going to push lead or completion times out even further which tightens you know which makes it harder on the inventory again at some point we're going to start seeing more completed homes coming on to into the inventory because of that lag that had happened that's going to start catching up and people are going to start putting those homes out there a lot quicker than they once did yeah go ahead and scan down let's find another one Oops. All right. Is lumber retail falling yet? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I haven't seen the two by fours coming down yet. They were still up quite expensive, but the plywood is dropping dramatically. Uh, we had it at, I don't know, $58 two weeks ago, and now it's at 39 So that's a pretty good drop as far as, as far as like plywood prices come down. Um, Everything else seems to still be fairly elevated. Uh, pressure treated, lumber is starting to come down a little bit. Um, we're starting to see more of that. So give it a little bit of time and I think the framing lumber, our framing lumber would come down. But again, most of this has to do with, with, your, um, with your supplier and how quick of a turnover they have. I mean, if you're in like a really high production area where there is a lot of demand for lumber and building supplies, they can turn that they can turn that stuff over really quick and then bring the prices down to match more of what like the market condition is as far as the futures markets go. But like us, we're kind of remote like out here in Astoria and then even worse you go up onto the peninsula and it's even more remote. Those guys, they have to wait a little bit longer in order to get their prices to come down. Seven dollars. Hey, we and pretty. I've really been enjoying the content lately. <clears throat> lately, full whip effect. How do you think we'll be able to tell if the oversupply has peaked? If the oversupply has peaked, um, I I don't know how you're going to be able to tell that. Um, you're just gonna like. You just have to kind of get a sense for it when you start seeing more of it. Like, what was the other question too? Wasn't there another one up there? Um, it's going to be difficult to see like what it is that that needs to to happen. Like the the indicator that says, "Hey, this is it. We've peaked out." But right now, we still like I was saying. Check out the article. We have a bunch of stuff that's now coming from Europe that's supposed to get here, and it's having a hard time. It's difficult, like getting the containers, getting the transportation, the ships, and the labor over there. I guess there's a lot of strikes that are taking place, like labor strikes. So that still has inventory, that still has material, stuff that is going to be coming to the United States. It's going to be hitting the East Coast at some point. So if things don't start moving here, if like people aren't buying the oversupply surplus that's already here, think about all that other stuff that's going to be coming in. I mean, there's like a bunch more coming. So that's going to be a pretty dangerous situation, especially for our you know domestic manufacturers, all the jobs that are here that are competing with this stuff, I mean, why would you need to compete with a flood of inventory that's coming in? So I don't think that we have peaked as far as like inventory supply coming in. I think we're just kind of getting to the point where we're really noticing the, the problems with it. Uh, oh, uh, cool dice. Yeah. What was that? Oh, cool dice. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to take them down? All right. Freddie loves hanging out. Freddie, what do you invest in? What do you like to buy? Uh, Pokemon or else I save. Yeah, Pokemon or he saves his money. Yeah, he doesn't invest yet, although yeah. we talked about getting like silver and all that going on. Yeah, <laughs> the dice. He has a little bit of silver, huh? Yeah. All right. You can buy these. You can buy these. Yeah. Uh, did we miss another super chat up there? Oh. Um. Nope. We... Oh, right there. I lost a ton of Bitcoin last month. I'm still buying gold, however, so I'll be fine, hopefully. No, you'll be fine. If you buy, when you buy into the precious metals, I mean, you're, you're really taking on very little risk. And the nice thing about, <laughs> hanging it off your ears, the nice thing about investing with, uh, within the gold and, and silver metals, like, I mean, in your hand, there's like, like I said, there's very little downside risk. You don't have to worry about like somebody else taking, like paying you your, your profits or just even sending you that envelope in the mail that shows that you have money coming to it. You're like out of that third party element of things. 
So that's like a really good position to be in. And if you think about it, like silver right now, I had a little bit of a drop. It's a slightly under $20 here. Let's not wear that particular one because I don't want to show the label off. But you can put the other hat on. Um, but if you... if. <laughs> kind of lost where I was at but if you if you think about like where silver is as far as the price of it goes it's at like $18 a piece the premiums are high but the downside risk like I, I mean it can go to five dollars again sure but the chances are it's probably not going to go to five dollars and anything under twenty dollars seems like it's a really good deal so in loading up on silver at this point I mean I I'm I can't see how there could be a whole lot of downside risk to that you know so that's a great place to save. Oh. Premium on a Silver Eagle is what? Right now, I over 15 ounce. Do you think... $15 an <clears throat> ounce? The premiums are too high? Yeah, that's a bit high. $15 an ounce on a, on a Silver Eagle. I mean, that puts you closer to $35 for one. Now, I have purchased Silver Eagles at $40 a piece, so... You know, if you're trying to stack, then, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about, like, what the price is. I mean, obviously, you don't want to pay too much for it. But I would be more concerned about how many you have because at some point, you're going to, if I mean, especially if you're wanting to sell it. Like, I'm not much into buying silver to sell. I buy silver to hold on to, to use it as an insurance policy, to have something that is outside of that third party. But if you're if if you're stacking silver, you're not really caring so much about the price that you're paying, but more of how many ounces you have. If you do dollar cost averaging, you're gonna end up with good deals, bad deals. It all comes out in the end with an average. Hopefully, at some point, you'll have you know your silver sitting at an average that is well below what the spot price is. So you know, again, at this point, like even at thirty-five dollars an ounce, like I, I wouldn't say it's the greatest deal, but I may buy it. And I I might do it. You know. All right. What does Lord Humongous say? If you don't hold it, you don't own it. That's exactly right. I mean, that's what it comes down to: is that you don't have to rely on that third party. That's that's what you're doing when you're buying silver. You're getting out of that risk, that third party risk. Let's go up a bit. Yeah. Go ahead and find another comment up there. Let's go lower. Uh, that's way up there. Pokemon cards have been a great investment. Oh, <laughs> I think we already read that one, didn't we? No. Uh, good job, Freddy. Yeah. Now let's go back down to the to more common. Here we go, Freddy. You ever? Oops. Freddy, you ever make ice cream in a Ziploc bag? Real easy, no polysorbate, eighty, and tastes real good. My kids love to make it. Fun project at home for kids. Well, let's do that today. You want to make some ice cream in a Ziploc bag? <laughs> that just blew his mind. He's going to be like, what? <laughs> yeah, we'll figure that out. We'll, we'll look up some uh, YouTube videos on how to do that. An economist called Robert Kiyosaki said that the, dollars is, the dollar is doomed to collapse eventually. Do you agree? Well, I mean, if you're talking eventually, yes. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. And it's not going to happen the next day. Eventually, the dollar will go away. All fiat currencies eventually die. So... You, I mean, yeah, I mean, at some point it will, it will go away. But again, you have to think like, is that going to happen today or tomorrow? And I just don't see that taken being the, being the case. What I do happen to see is that we're going to go into a major downturn when it comes to like recessionary forces and you're going to have like incredibly good deals. I mean, you think about it, recession, like I've heard Robert Kiyosaki say this, Re he loves recessions because everything goes on sale. Right. So what do you have to have during a recession? Cash. You have to have cash in order to take advantage of those of that situation. All right. Let's see here. Average lifespan of fiat currency is 35 years, historically speaking. Yeah, that's right. And so you think about it like we're due. Right. I mean, Brenton Woods was in 1971. So what? We're 41 years into it now. And or even more than that. Right. Um I guess, no, 50 years into it. So, so yeah, like, it, and it's, it, it almost seems like it's apparent that we are going to be switching over to the central bank digital currencies. Like, it does to me. And 
when I think about like some of the things that are taking place with the central banks around the world who are all pretty much like working on their central bank digital currencies, it's like they're getting ready to collapse the fiat currencies. Like they don't even want them anymore, or at least not in the sense that we have them today. They would much rather have us locked into a digital system that we just simply can't get out of. And that would be probably more of like what the death of the dollar is gonna look like is that transition into central bank digital currencies. Yeah, why don't you find another question there, kiddo? I'm gonna go up just a little bit. You know, I met Robert Kiyosaki. I met him this weekend, and we talked to, we talked quite a bit. Um, we had lunch together, sitting at the uh, table in the green room, and he's a really nice guy. I mean, it's kind of funny when you listen to him up on stage or something. He can get kind of aggressive and stuff, but when you talk to him just personally, he's a really nice guy. We already saw that one, right? Yeah, we already saw that one here. Cruise to the bottom here. We got to find some questions so we don't have dead air. Oops. Dinosaurs. <laughs> Dinosaurs, yeah. Uh, FWIW. Comex delivery price is detached from bullion because there is a different bottleneck in production. It is easy to make Comex bars, so production is more elastic. Grab a bunch of dollars and hold on to them for the great grandchildren to sell as historical, no as historical novelty uh, items. Thoughts? Well, I mean, that's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I do have a collection of kind of unique bills and old bills and stuff like that. So I guess I've already done that. Um, you know, somebody must have done it back in the day because I ended up with their collection of it or I found. It's kind of amazing the stuff that you find throughout like your life that you know, it was like somebody had come up to me and they were like hey man i pulled this soffit down it was actually my stepfather he says i pulled the soffit down in my house and this box came with it and it had a silver coin and a u.s treasury note a two dollar treasury note had like silver certificates it had some like old kind of funny money stuff in there and like somebody had thought of that back in the day to think hey this is like kind of unique stuff Maybe we'll hold on to it for, you know, for a collection piece later on. And it ended up in my collection. So, yeah, that happens. Hi, uneducated economist junior. They're talking about you. Hey, Freddie, are you a young, educated economist? Yes. Yes, he is. He is very much. Um, it's kind of funny because I, he, he looks up like in the morning as I'm drinking coffee, he'll look up what the U.S. tenure is at as far as the yield what the mortgage is and he comes and gives me a report in the morning about what those two are so that's kind of a fun little game that we play and um what else we talk a lot about bitcoin and gold and bonds and you know kind of all the stuff good debt and bad debt i need pressure yeah you want to get out yeah i'm gonna get out for okay a hold sec. on let me grab the phone so you don't uh, go gonna... ahead and head on out i'm gonna come back in though okay we'll go get your air it is good it's it's really not I'm trying. <laughs> Here, hold that for a second. Keep going like that. There you go. That door kind of sticks a little bit. All right. Fredicated. Yeah, that's what we should call his channel. Fredicated Economist. All right. I bought some silver today. Gonna hold until I have. Oops. Until I have silver hair. There you go. That's the way you do it, man. You hold on to it till you have silver hair. I saw a headline that claimed 10-year U.S. bonds the worst they've been since 1700s. Worst in what way? I mean, the yield on them is, like, nowhere near, like, as low as they once were. So I guess, like, the performance from, say, a couple of years ago when they were down around, what, 1% or less? to now on the yield so i guess like that performance is that what you're talking about as far as the worst performance i'm not sure what that's supposed to be all right i saw let's see oh i just read that one you are teaching your son amazing information for the future of is of his education yeah it's amazing like <laughs> i think he like it, it's i don't know what he talks about like with his like his friends at school or with the teachers, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, that he kind of blows their mind when he talks about like good debt and bad debt. Um, he took off to go hang out with his brother, but he explained that one pretty good. He talked about, he used, um, 
a car, like if you borrow money to buy a car and then use the car to make deliveries, then that's like good debt because the car will end up paying for itself by using it to work with. But if you use debt to buy ice cream, then you eat the ice cream and then you have to, you know, you have to work to pay that, pay that back. And those were the two analogies that he used when he was trying to explain uh, good debt versus bad debt. And I was pretty impressed with that. He came up with it all on his own. All right. He probably means 10-year yield performance this morning was down almost 20 points at one point. Yeah, I, I mean, we're going to see some serious volatility taking place in that. I mean, I if you look like, the, I mean, shoot, I was looking from like, what, the one year to the 30 year? I mean, it's practically flat. I don't think there was much yield difference between between those. And I mean, if you're I, you know, a lot of people look at that two year tenure and look for the inversion of that to be like the recession indicator. But I'm going with the Alan Greenspan kind of thought in that the widening between the five year and the 30 year shows what did he call it? Corporate management's willingness to invest. So when you see the spread on those start to widen, that's when I'm going to start jumping back into or back in. That's when I'm going to jump into the stock market. And when I say jump into the stock market, I mean dollar cost average into. I don't know, my little stock portfolio, I don't have much in it. Um, but that's really where I'm going to start moving because I think that the stock market is going to continue to fall until we see that that widening between the five-year and 30-year for the corporate management's willingness to invest. Again, I don't know what any of all that stuff means. It's what Alan Greenspan said, so I'm just going to follow his lead. A lot of people will think that's crazy. I don't care. Um, you know, I've listened to Alan Greenspan quite a bit. And that dude is confusing as hell, especially when he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I mean, in fact, he had like a famous quote said that if you understood what I said, you probably misunderstood me or something like that. Or if you something like that to that effect, like, you know, if you if you got it, then you probably missed it because he was so confusing when he talked. But that was something that I remember him saying when and he said that when they asked him about. Like it was an interview and they said, well, since interest rates will probably never rise again. And he laughed at the person who said that. He's like, yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Right. Well, here we are. Right. We're watching the interest rates rise. And a lot of there was a time a few years back that people did not believe it. They thought it was negative interest rates. It was downhill from here on out. Dollar total destruction. Not going to strengthen at all. That's not the case. I mean, yields are rising. The dollar is strengthening on a world scale. Hey, thank you very much. Vince for the twenty dollars. Hey you E and Freddie, I work for a Fortune five hundred home builder in Phoenix. As markets as a market researcher and have a UE coffee mug sitting on my desk. I love your housing market content. Keep up the great work. Cheers. Well thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Um you know, for the twenty dollars in for the great compliment, uh, I, you know, I just come out and I try and tell you guys the things that I see, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's not always so like clear picture. Sometimes I have to, you know, use that anecdotal stuff, like you know, the things that I'm seeing, the things that I'm hearing. You know, one of the things that I was looking at to, as far as an indicator of inflation, was the felt paper, was asphalt impregnated felt. And it's, it seems like such a just bonehead product, right? Hardly anybody even uses this stuff anymore. I mean, it's more of like, like synthetic house wraps and stuff like that for vapor barriers, but it's not like it's something that is not purchased. I mean, it is purchased and you go through it, but the price of it hardly moved. I mean, I think we, I think we adjusted it the entire time through all this stuff. I think it's gone up maybe, maybe 10%. So a $31 roll now sells for $34. All right? I mean, it's not like hardly anybody even noticed that that one moved. <laughs> oh, looks like Freddie found a, found a dog to play with out there. See him back there playing with the, with the yellow lab. <laughs> All right. Real good dude, Yui. Seems to be... What is that, a bee? I'm not sure. I agree, Spider. Alan Greenspan is a gold bug. He is definitely a gold bug. And, man, I can't remember the... Uh, maybe you guys remember. It was, like, back in the 70s, he wrote, like, a, a little essay or something about, like, what gold is and why it needs to be part of your... Why, why it's really the money and fiat is not. I mean, he wrote this great essay on it. And, gosh, I wish I could remember the name of that thing, but... 
Like I said, maybe one of you guys can remember and let me know. My dog stepped on a bee. E. Uh, that's the only thing I remember from that. Management consultant current client is the Dow Jones Index. Professional system thinker and absolutely love your progressive progressive logic walkthroughs. Well, thank you, man. Like again, you know, I'm not I'm not following anybody else's lead here. I take in this information, I I think about it. I, I come out here and I try and give it to you like is the way I see it, the way I feel about it. And, you know, there was a time when I used to listen to a lot of economists out there, a lot of other, a lot of like YouTubers and, and stuff like that. And I found myself mimicking them. Like I, I would almost sound just like them. Like when I listened to a lot of Peter Schiff, I mean, I could sound just like Peter Schiff when I did. And I was like realizing, man, are you, am I like, really staying true to who I am and in my beliefs or am I just following somebody else's lead so I had to cut him off I had to I had to like not stop listening to him just to make sure that I knew that I was staying true to myself and you know I mean it must be working because you know look <laughs> I mean the channel is almost to a hundred thousand subscribers and I never thought that I would ever have a thousand subscribers let alone even a hundred subscribers but here we are a hundred thousand it's just it's mind blowing. All right. So lumber is starting another run up. Um, well, if you, you know, actually, I mean, not to shy away from my lumber reports because I really appreciate everybody following me and my, you know, and my views of the lumber industry and what I have to say. But Madison, Madison Lumber, I think is what it is. Um, she does a phenomenal job on her YouTube channel. I was listening to her video earlier today and she was talking about the mill curtailments and she is actually putting together a mill curtailment report for people to, I don't know if she, I think she's charging for it, which I'm, I'm going to go buy it. I mean, I'm going to support, support her in the, uh, in the efforts, but, uh, it goes, I mean, her reports were very much along the lines of the things that I was hearing from, from the industry. So I don't have like. A report to go to like I don't have like something I can say here you guys go this is where where I'm getting my information I mean I'm hearing it from all directions and then I, I come out here and I I let you guys know about it right now we have a situation like you think about it it's the middle of summer this is where we should be punch, pushing out as much lumber as possible and mills are in curtailment I mean they're actually tightening up their inventory and the main reasons are for the same thing that I had been saying it was like a lot of it has to do with the fact that they can't get this lumber away from the mill fast enough like there is a transportation issue there's labor issues or whatever and they just simply don't have any place to put this lumber after they produce it so they have to like curtail development in order to get the the room for the inventory to move I also have a sneak and suspicion that the high demand that was you know, running this lumber inventory up to where it is today has dissipated. And I think a lot of it, you, you, like I said, with the pressure treated company, when I was talking with them, going from over a million board feet or million pounds a day that they were shipping out to now seven or 800,000 pounds really shows a significant slowdown in the amount of lumber that they are selling. And you got to think about it. Like they're the ones who have like first access to the mills. Like there are huge buyers of, of lumber and so they're like the ones who are getting it first. And if they are slowing down, if they are dropping their prices, what is that going to say about the rest of the industry? Lumber is probably going to bounce around as far as like the normal price. But that's like, I couldn't tell you where the average or what the normal is, but anything under 600 and mills are going to shut down. They're like, we're not producing at this low of a price and anything over 800 and they're going to try and push out as much lumber as possible. So it's going to be somewhere in between there. I doubt, I very seriously doubt that we are going to run up to anything like the 1400 or anything like that. Could it happen? Sure. I mean, I can't predict the future, but it, I don't feel that I don't feel that that's going to be the case anything like i said once it gets up to 800 per thousand mills are going to punch out a bunch of lumber people are going to start slowing down on their sales inventory rises and then the prices fall uh, oversupply undersupply oversupply so we saw the oversupply not hit like it did last summer to the 400 per thousand i mean it hit what 550 so it, we're starting to find the volatility is starting to e equalize, right? We're coming to that equilibrium. 
All right, let's go down to the bottom here. 410 of you up in here. I really appreciate it. Hit that like button if you haven't done it. We'll get more people out here in the super chat. Or not. Sorry, guys. Out here in the chats. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> and uh, that makes it a lot more fun. Uh, let's see here. How do you think the November midterm elections will play into the economy? Um, I don't know. I don't follow politics. I just gave up on that a long time ago. And... A lot of people tell me that it's impossible to follow economics and not be involved in politics or not follow politics and still understand economics. And I can tell you now there was a time when I was incredibly like motivated in the thoughts of politics. Like I followed everybody. I knew every congressperson's name. I would listen hours on end to you know to everybody talking and to break down everything that they were saying and i found myself incredibly frustrated trying to understand the monetary systems in the economy once i set those guys away i said that's it i am not listening to you boneheads anymore i'm done with that i started listening to the federal reserve following the federal reserve speeches and the speeches are different from what they come out and say Okay, so when they're out there on CNBC and they're talking and they're, you hear their jawboning going on, that's just a little tiny piece. They're just giving you a little tiny piece of what they're saying. Go and read their speeches. That's really where the information is. And a lot of people ask me how it is that I was able to come up with a lot of this stuff. It's because I'm following the Federal Reserve speeches. That's, that's where the real information is. Especially like if you really want to know what's going on with what happened over the last couple of years, Go and read, I think, I'm pretty sure it was November of 2018, John Williams, the New York Fed president, had the speech, Monetary Policy for a Low Neutral Rate World. Whoa, that speech is very telling of what happened because it was in that speech that John Williams said that they were going to, going to let inflation run extra hot for extra long for an extended period of time. How did he know that they were going to be able to do that? I mean, you think about it. They just went through all this quantitative easing and failed to achieve their 2% target on any kind of sustainable path. I mean, they, they got to it a couple of times, but for the most part, it ran under 2%. But yet in November of 2018, John Williams is talking about how it is that they were going to let inflation run extra hot for extra long for an extended period of time. And it didn't make any sense to me. I was like, how are you going to get that, John? How are you going to get that inflation? 2020 kicks, pandemic. Um... Good job, dude. I get it now. All right. So that's how you're going to get this inflation to run up. And I mean, that's why I didn't fall for it. That's why I'm not falling for this stuff. Like the inflation thing was was totally fabricated. I mean, it was it was done. Like, I mean, whether they took advantage of the pandemic or it was created, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, that that part is inconsequential. It doesn't matter. What matters is the outcome from it, right? That's what matters. It, it, all the excuses in the world doesn't change what the outcome is. And when you think about how there was going to be a housing market crisis, everybody was going to lose their jobs. Every, I mean, it was going to be, it was going to be horrible. But then they came out with the stimulus packages, and they came out with the special purpose vehicles, and you know, if they didn't have the unusual and exigent circumstance. We would have failed. the The economy would have crashed and burned, and would have been over. So I'm coming back. You want to come back in? All right. All right. Let's see. How? Oops. How do you think the November? Oh, we already talked about that. All right. I was playing with those people over there, and I smoked on a Oh yeah, you did. Are you all right? I was playing with them and the dog. Yeah, I saw that. Did you like playing with the dog? Yeah. They seem like a friendly group. I could hear them over there talking. All right. Why not both gold and Bitcoin? No, buy that. Yeah, definitely buy. I mean, cash, gold, silver, Bitcoin. That's the way to go. Are you okay? Yeah. And I have gymnastics today. And you have what? Gymnastics. Yeah, you do. Well, you'll be better by gymnastics. So. Yeah, hopefully. Freddie has a ninja warrior class, a ninja kids class, and they that's a cool class. huh? They learn to do flips and kicks and jumps and mm -hmm. trampolines and all kinds of stuff. It's a really cool class. All right, you hold on to gold and silver because it has no third-party counter risk. If you don't understand that, keep buying your stocks and bonds. Yeah, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And You know, I mean, I guess, you know, there is, 
I mean, there's definitely, you know, the position that you can take that says, hey, I mean, gold's going to run up to, you know, an incredibly high price and I'm going to be able to trade all my gold over for a house. But I mean, think about it like that then. Like, you know, I'm going to acquire like try and like say find the average house price to gold price or how many ounces it takes to buy a house, his, you know, throughout history and i don't know somebody i'm sure already has that information i could probably figure it out and do it in a video but if you figure that out and then acquire that many ounces of gold and then just wait for the wait for the time to trade it over for a house you know? troll bots need moderator simon yeah is there a bunch of trolls out there that's how i should make lord humongous the moderator of this channel uh we want our son's opinion on, oh wants your son's opinion on BTC I won't stop asking what do you think of Bitcoin I don't really know much about it no well what do you think Bitcoin is it, it's a computer it's a computer which you can put into like well I, I, I forgot I forgot you put him on the spot he's talked about Bitcoin before that's okay. We'll talk about Bitcoin again. And I'm gonna go put some in there, dog. Oh, you you want to go over there? Okay, <laughs> okay. yeah, that's fine. Right all right. I, I like dogs. I know you do. You love uh -huh. dogs. Why? All right. BTC is garbage price. Yeah. The only thing Freddie likes is silver and cash. That's like. I tried talking to him about Bitcoin. I said, well, let's get you an account for, you know, and get you start saving some Bitcoin. And he's like, oh, okay. That's like, that's his attitude towards it. But if you ask him if you want to go buy a silver, he's all about that. I mean, he's definitely down for buying some silver. All right. Little UE, yeah. Russia is talking about backing a crypto with gold now. Yeah. Um, I... At some point, you're going to find that somebody is going to have a pretty significant cryptocurrency backed by gold. The only problem with it is, is where's the gold? You back to a third party risk again. And I mean, now, like Russia already has, um, I think the, even their biggest nickel mine, if I remember right, is tokenizing their nickel. So you have to buy the token in order to get the nickel, which is kind of cool. You think about it, you can own the token and essentially own the nickel. And if you ever wanted to sell nickel, you just get rid of your token. And then the people who got the token can go and, and acquire the nickel. Now, that seems like a pretty cool like system that they have going on there. But I, I mean, that was like a couple of years ago, I read this article and I have yet to hear of how this nickel mine and the tokenization of this nickel has really like become the awesome craze or something that everybody's gonna do. Great kid, Yui. Let him be a kid as long as you can. Mine eh, are all grown up. Miss those days. Yeah, I, I do. He's He is so smart. I don't know. I don't know how it is that he ended up how he is my kid. Like he can read so well and he just retains all kinds of stuff and he engages with people socially. He's like smart to when you have a conversation with them like i've seen adults like sit down and actually have a conversation with them he's a great kid i mean just just an amazing little human all right when does fed pivot um you know what i i mean pivot in which way like stop raising interest rates if that's the question wait for this term wait wait till you hear the federal reserve say we are data dependent once you hear that, then you know that they have come to an end of the lift, lifting of interest rates. That's that's where the, where, I mean, it may still go a little bit, but you know that's like the, the moment that it's coming to an end. It's data dependent. That's what, you know, that's what you're waiting for the Fed to say. No surprise, Freddie is sharp, man. Come on, give yourself some credit. I, I, I do. I mean, you know, I, I just can't t say enough good things. I mean, he's polite. He's, you know, he's friendly. I don't know. He's just a great kid. Uh, Freddie is a sharp young man. You're a good father. Well, I appreciate it. Handsome little fellow, smart little boy. He is. He is. He's a great kid. You should see him. He reads Bloomberg articles to me. Yeah, hey, you know, I, I, he read one on the way in today. He read one yesterday to me. Bitcoin isn't worth three copper pennies. <laughs> Lord Humongous just hates that Bitcoin, man. <laughs> it's understandable. I get it. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see here. Whenever Bitcoin dies, everyone else calls for crazy lows in the same way. When Bitcoin at 65, everyone's calling for 100,000. Same old story won't change because human psychology doesn't change. Yeah, um, and especially if you have something as crazy volatile as Bitcoin. Now, you know, somebody made tried to make fun of me or something saying that I was, you know, I had lost a bunch of money in Bitcoin. I have never sold any Bitcoin ever. I, I, and when I purchase Bitcoin, I usually buy like $50 at a time. I have been doing it a long time. So I don't even know what my average is anymore. I just, I just buy $50 whenever. I don't really care about where the price is at the time. And, you know, I mean, I had a bunch given to me, so there's no way I could be underwater or be under, under my, you know, how much I put into it. It's just the, you know, it's just one of those things that you should probably not really be too concerned about as far as like what the price is. What I would be more concerned about is how many you can get. And so when you're down at 20,000, I mean, you think about it, there's only ever going to be what 21 million of these things and a ton of them are gone. Like they just disappeared, lost in computer, you know, the computer that's thrown into the landfills or just got, you know, just disappeared because people weren't paying attention to what happened with their wallets. So you, you think about it, the 21 million supply of Bitcoin is going to be far less than that. And if you can get one, if you can acquire just one Bitcoin, I mean, think about how rare that is. Even if, you know, even if it's $20,000, I mean, or it goes to 100000 whatever. I mean, just having one of these things is such a, a rare opportunity. I don't know why people wouldn't try and do it. I'm like, I think I'm what, somewhere around a third, a little over a third of a Bitcoin right now. So I have a long ways to go before I end up with a whole Bitcoin, but I'm working on it. $50 at a time. Thank you very much for the $1.99. What does that say? Ghost Stallion? Is that what it says? Stallone? I can't, God, my bonus is. I need to cover it up. Okay. Uh, the powers at the powers that be created Bitcoin to replace the dollar. Yeah, I can believe that. Um, might you agree that the churning point on the Fed intervention is probably the July adjustment, as it may be large, and all expected future adjustments are expected to be twenty-five basis points. Um. Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, they were trying to, they're trying to mess with the inflation expectation. That's it. Like, go and read all their speeches, right? They talk about inflation expectation, 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 expectation. That's like everything. That's why the credible threat is the is their main tool is because they got to get that expectation out there. So a 0.75% interest or a 0.75% increase on the Fed funds rate that's pretty significant. That hit the that hit the market hard. I mean, everybody kind of like, whoa, you know, look at this. They want way more than what they were expecting. They're trying to hammer that in expectation. And if they if the inflation expectation remains high, they're gonna hit you again with another 0.75. The only thing is, is that once they get over neutral, which is probably not too far from where they're at, they're gonna become really constricting of the economy. But nobody will notice that until six months down the road, six months to a year. See, this is why I don't believe that anything that the Fed has done has done anything to the economy because they have barely started lifting interest rates. But the perception is really taking an impact right now. So, I mean, it's all about expectations. That's really what it's all about. All right. Uh, I just crashed the... They just crashed the dollar. Look at M2 supply. Um, okay. I will take a look at that. I don't know. What is M2 supply at right now? Is it just off the charts high? I mean, just incredibly high? Where does most of that money sit when they do quantitative easing? Do you know where it goes? I mean, you think about that for a little bit. It sits on the big bank's balance sheet, and until it's lent into the system, that's where it is. Now, granted, a lot of stimulus went into the economy, but the stimulus went into buying beer, right? So we all got drunk, had a great time on it. Now it's time to have the hangover and go to work. And that sucks. Working on, you got to work all week with a hangover. And at the end of the week, you don't get to party. That sucks, right? So that's the type of environment that we're going into is that we have to work with a hangover. 
Um, UE, I started watching Jeff Snyder. Very informative videos. Yes, absolutely it is. Jeff Snyder, I mean, if you have not, I encourage everybody to go and check out Jeff Snyder's. The, um, oh, what is this series? The, um, the Euro Dollar University, something like that. Um, that's an excellent, excellent series. I'm going to go and watch it again. Um, I just started the first one. I think there's, what, four or five of them in there. They're like a half an hour long or so. Um, I'm sorry, we got a walkie-talkie over here. So anyhow, um, I just started re-watching it again. He had an excellent presentation at the, at the Rebel Capitalist Live event. You should have seen people came out of that, out of his discussion with like, their minds were just blown. They were like, whoa, holy moly, never thought of it like this, never realized about the massive amounts of dollars that are outside of the United States, right? And how this collapsing of the euro dollars, euro dollars is really going to drive the dollar stronger. And it's, and it's very difficult to wrap your head around this stuff. And Jeff Snyder explains it so well. He is, the dude is just amazing. All right. A lot of gold bugs here. Yeah, you're going to find a lot of gold bugs on my channel. I mean, we we definitely like buying our gold. We <laughs> The difference is, is that some of us buy it for different reasons, but it doesn't matter why you're buying it as long as you buy it. Right? That's that's the important part. I mean, that's it is. His videos on mass formation psychosis was best I have seen in a while. Yeah, I'm going to go and take some time to to listen to Jeff. Um he really, he, he really sparked my interest again at the rebel capitalist. I mean, especially the way the people reacted to his, to his, to his, uh, speech. It was just, his presentation was just amazing. And you know, who does an incredible presentation is Mark Moss. He is probably does like the most entertaining, informative, awesome presentation. Like he keeps you engaged. It's just Mark Moss, he kills it at those presentations. He does a great job. All right. Uh, more thinking the opposite. It could be anti-powers that be for Bitcoin. Look at the energy push for green transition. Wouldn't it be the push for proof of stake for energy savings like XRP and ADA? Um, I don't know. The only thing that I think of, the only, sorry, somebody was talking to my kid over there. Um, what I think about when it comes to Bitcoin is the security of it. Okay. And that's really where, like, I think Bitcoin stands apart from most other cryptocurrencies out there. Now, I might be wrong on this, but as from the information that I have gathered out there, they know, like, it's known how to hack Bitcoin, right? You have to take over 51% of the miners. The chances of that being possible are such an insignificant, like small opportunity for anything like that to happen that it pretty much makes Bitcoin the most secure crypto out there. That being the case, that's what I have my thoughts towards security level, right? If you can't hack this thing and it still hasn't been hacked and it's still going forward, the protocol still works that's that's it man that's the digital gold right there now other coins out there might be faster easier more fit all that other stuff might be cheaper on energy but they don't carry the security level they might have really high security level like you know even awesome like there's no chance of those ones being hacked either but it doesn't achieve what bitcoin can do and considering the secondary layers like the lightning networks and stuff i just don't see why anybody would want anything other than bitcoin i mean there's nothing that the other coins are doing that bitcoin isn't doing or won't be able to do into the future so i just don't know why anybody would want to do anything else right again there's some awesome programs out there there's some definitely there's some alternate coins some altcoins that are going to do very well like there's some that are going to that are going to make it right just like the dot-com era but a lot of these things are going to fail and that's just how I see it, you know. All right. Uh, privacy. Yeah, there is no privacy. And you're going to lose all privacy in all directions. That's just unfortunate. 
I pretty much gave up on the idea of it. Now, I am a constitutionalist. I, I mean, I study the Constitution. I believe in privacy. I believe in personal freedoms. If you are using a phone, you are using somebody else's, you know, using somebody else's business, right? So you have to give up your privacy to do that, right? It's not, I mean, if it was something that you created and somebody was trying to get into it, then that would be another thing. I understand that when I agree to use my phone and to use the apps and all that other stuff that I am just basically giving everything away, all right? It sucks, but that's what I'm doing. When I realize that, what I do is I encrypt everything. I encrypt all my personal messages, mainly with my wife. That's because everything else is out there. But the personal messages that I have with my family, like th those I keep private. I encrypt those things because an encryption app like Telegram or something like that is a very easy way to keep from your privacy being exposed out there. That's that's a private conversation. I don't want anybody else involved in that. If you want to look at all the things that I've Googled, so be it. Like, I, there was a time in my life that I looked up every single conspiracy theory and everything that I could possibly, there is nothing out there that could possibly have been Googled, especially when it comes to government conspiracies and takeovers and all that other stuff. I mean, I dove deep. I even downloaded the Tor browser so I could get into some like dark web stuff so I could pursue that. If you're ever going to get in trouble for something that you had looked at, I would have done it, right? You know, the only thing I don't, I mean, other than like porn or something like that, I don't, I'm not into porn. Um, but as far as all the like, crazy conspiracy stuff there's there's hardly anything out there that i haven't seen you know and i tell you if you really want to know what the biggest conspiracy th is out there go and look up the sovereign go and look up what a citizen is go and look up what accepted for value is and i mean you'll learn some stuff about what this country really is all about and who the people are in it all right how long have we been out here an hour and a half okay Hit the like button. Yeah, please hit the like button. Thank you very much. Uh, S-A-F-U-U -U is the king of DeFi. Yeah, I don't know. I'm still... I'm still, like, up in the air on this DeFi thing. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, like, I'm learning a lot about the... about the decentralized finance and stuff like that, but I, I don't know. I'm still... I'm still a little iffy. Uh... Okay, Andreas Anton. Oh God, I can never say his name. Antolopoulos <laughs> explains Bitcoin fifty-one percent attack. Enormous energy needed, and money chain will fork. Yeah. All right, UE. If privacy is what you are looking for, check out XX Messenger and Graphene OS for phone. Monero for digital currencies. Yeah. Um. Again, I've just, I mean, here's another thing that somebody had told me one time. If you're trying to hide, if you like literally try to hide all your information, your Google searches, your messages, your emails, all that stuff. If you go into like this hiding, you will go to the top of the list. You will go right to the top of the list of people they want to research and figure out who, the, who you are, right? Because they don't have any information on you. So now you're at the top of the list. The guy who told me this, he said, give them more information than what they can use. And I don't know what the name of the program was, but he had this program that he would run on his computer that would do blanket shotgun searches on throughout Google and throughout the Internet that would just pull up random articles, recipes, just anything, just all kinds of stuff, things that he has no interest in. And the idea behind that is, is that they can't figure out what it is that you're truly looking at or for if if you have this constant wave of stuff coming in as far as his information he said give them too much give them more than what they can handle and you can hide that way so it's like kind of hiding in plain sight i don't know if it works but that's what he told me and i said well man, go for it you know all right i'm out thumbs up people make me a moderator simon you know what i want to do that how do i do that um Hide user. No, I don't want to hide user. Add a moderator. There you go. 
Lord Humongous, you are now a moderator of my channel. Uh, I see these people posting, and Lord Humongous, don't be deleting Bitcoin stuff, okay? If you, like, just because you disagree with it or else I'm going to unmoderate you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, just do be mad at the BTC beats. No, he won't do it. Uh, um, congratulations, a mod. Yeah, well, we'll see what, uh, we'll see how he does, you know. You see here, let me find another question here. Uh, okay, it's okay if viewers can't handle a healthy debate. No, it's it's okay. It's just when it starts getting into like, you know, trolling and just being just, you know, belligerent or something like that. Like I said, you know, I'm going to give him a shot and if Lord can't handle it and can't handle his position, then I'll have to unmoderate him. So, and I mean, but I do agree that there probably should be some sort of moderation going on here, or at least somebody there. All right. Um, I see all these people posting in YouTube comments about crypto and DeFi as scammers just trying to promote their investments. Yes. And that's, and, and that's the thing. Like, you know, I mean, you know, you come onto the channel and I get it all the time. Like I have like people who try to impersonate like the channel and all kinds of stuff. And man, is that not annoying? I mean, it's just like a pain. I just want people on here who can, you know, who have something to contribute. I mean, if you disagree, then that's fine. I mean, I want you to disagree. Lord Humongous disagrees with me for the reasons why we buy silver. Like he, I mean, I buy silver merely as a savings. And I mean, he's pretty much convinced that it's going to be the only thing that's going to be available out there as far as any kind of value or wealth. That's, I mean, I don't believe that, but that's cool. We can have our difference of opinions. We both agree on silver. So, I mean, he doesn't like Bitcoin. I do. I don't think he has a problem with that. He disagrees with it. I I mean, Lord Humongous has been here pretty much since the beginning of my channel. And, you know, I I, I think I can trust him. You know, we're going to find out. <laughs> All right. Everyone has their opinion. That's right. Okay. Do you learn anything at RCP to help you monetize your channel? Um, are you, uh, at the Rebel Capitalist, you mean? Is that at that one um i learned actually quite a bit um there's a couple of guys who have really you know thrown me some ideas as far as what i can do to expand the channel expand the you know the efforts that i'm putting into it and how to monetize some of the stuff uh one of the ideas um one of the ideas that uh people had was to do these live streams in a private chat that you had to pay for to get into it um I'm a, I'm I'm a little leery of doing something like that. I I like to just give it away and you guys reward me for that. And I mean just demanding payment for it. I I I mean I guess I could. I don't know how well that would work. Um it was suggested to me by a few people. Maybe I could do both. I don't I don't know like if that would work, but that was one of the things um, newsletters to build up like an email list and or something like that and distribute newsletters and to have like a monthly subscription and maybe get like a newsletter once or twice a week from me. Um, these were some of the ideas that people had as far as being able to monetize some of my efforts and ideas. Um, I'm still learning on, on a lot of this stuff. I just, you know, from the very beginning, I just thought if I just gave it away, you know, just just here you can have as much as uh, of all the information that i have you guys would reward me for it and you have i mean i have been i beyond whatever i thought would ever happen you know and i i can't thank you all enough i mean so i have i have like difficulties trying to to convince myself that that would be the way that i should go with it you know i don't know what do you guys think uh what did you think of george gammon love to love the hat oh george is george is an awesome dude um you know george is super tall like 
I'm almost six foot tall. I'm five eleven and a half, right? I didn't quite make it to six foot. George makes me look like a little kid standing next to him. I mean, I got this picture, standing, and he just like, I just feel like this little kid standing next to him. Brent Johnson too. The dude is like, you know, the two of them. I'm like, I'm like, hey guys, what's up? You know, and I'm like looking, like I look up to him, but then I'm really looking up to him. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. I'm the ghost of Milton Friedman. That's funny. Who is the dang hunk above me? Uh, uh, let's see here. I have signed. I have a signed by George Gammon and the Fed hat. Oh, that would be a good idea. I should have had him sign mine. Jerome Powell says economy is strong. I doubt that. I what? What could he be talking about? I don't know what, what he would be looking at that says the, the economy is strong. Maybe the labor market? I guess if you look at the labor market, then you would say the economy is strong. Everybody who wants a job can have one. But that's going to change soon. All right. It, Jerome Powell's a horrible criminal. Well, let's see. I named my pig J. Pow Pow. <laughs> Janet Yellen says that inflation is transitory. Um, I hate to say it, but I kind of agree with that. Not with Janet Yellen, but just the idea of inflation being transitory, right? I mean, it's the expansion of money and credit. What's happening right now? How many loans? How many house loans, car loans, credit cards? How much debt are, is people willing to take out right now? Is that expanding or contracting? I mean, that's really where, like, inflation is going to be coming from. The expansion of money that went into the system. Like, a lot of people think this, like, all this cash is all of a sudden got dumped, and that's all this cash is now. Most of it is sitting in the banks. Most of it is sitting on the banks, of the, is sitting in reserves at the big banks, and until that is lent into the system, it's still there. It's like, it, it doesn't circulate through the economy. I mean, you could have, think about it, if you had a million dollars, and you sat in the bank, and all you were willing to do was spend $100 of it, how much circulation of a million dollars is going through the economy? It's not. It's just sitting in the bank. It's not doing anything. It might as well not even be there. But because you say all this money exists and then cut off the supply chain, diminish the available products out there, demand goes way up, people will pay any price to get their products if they can't find it, inflation starts to rise, and then everybody points at the Fed and says, there it is, they did it, you know? And I'm like, well, I mean, if that's what you want to believe, then go and believe that. I mean... I'm looking at it differently, and I'm starting to, I mean, how else was I able to call the, you know, the situation we're in right now with the high inventory levels? I called this a long time ago. I said at some point, all those, all that stuff on all those ships, I said this over six months ago, is going to eventually find its way into the stores and onto the shelves, and people aren't going to know what to do with all this stuff. And that's what's happening. It's what's happening right now. All right. Okay, thoughts on gold and silver inflation at 40-year high, and they are actually moving lower. What My thoughts on that, my thoughts are, is that you should be picking up on the undervalued, unappreciated, useful items like gold and silver. That's what that tells me. You know, when you have 100 ounces of silver for every one in existence, then yeah, there's plenty of supply out there if you consider all the paper. Take the paper away and how much silver is actually available? Not a whole lot. The more you have in hand, the more physical you have, the better you're going to be. And this is what's going to eventually happen. Now, I couldn't tell you how far out it's going to take or what it's going to take to make it happen. But all this paper silver that's out there driving down the price, if enough people start taking the physical off the market, you think about it, what is less than, I don't know what the exact yearly production of silver is, but it's what, eight, 900 million ounces or something? If you took every single American and you bought just two ounces of silver, right, for every single person in the United States just went out and tried to acquire two ounces of silver, less than $100 worth of silver, it would wipe out the entire global world manufactured supply. Right, just the United States, include Canada, Mexico, Russia, India, China, all of Europe. I mean, how much silver purchasing would it have to take to wipe out the entire global supply? Probably not a whole lot. I know hardly anybody personally who actively buys silver. A few people, but almost nobody. 
And in fact, when you try to encourage them to do it, they'll deny it. They're like, worthless metal, won't do it. And I'm like, you know, it doesn't take that much and it would be gone. When that happens and a manufacturer who's going to look to buy silver for the cell phone or whatever he was wanting to build, they're wanting to build, and they can't find it, they will pay any price because not that much silver goes into that particular product. There's like, the demand for silver can just explode when it comes to all the tech that's out there. Think about all the AI, the solar, the everything going electric. Silver is a major component of this. And I mean, I'm not trying to ramp it up like the idea of buying silver because someday you're going to sell it off for a major profit. But the possibilities are like way, way up there. And to have that kind of opportunity right now to pick up silver as cheap as it is. I don't know why I don't know why you wouldn't do it like I mean at least get a little bit right get your hands on some and what did you find this is something interesting once you once you get your hands on some of that silver and you have it in your hand you all of a sudden realize why you're buying it and you just want to get more you just want to get more of it all right bull whip and silver uh I doubt it. Um, Because like the bullwhip effect, the bullwhip effect is more where like the supply chain has misunderstandings of what is actually occurring. So it would, what it takes is like a panic buy or something else within the industry that just obscures what's really going on. And that's where like, that's where, like, I used that plumbing fitting. It just made so much sense, you know, when I when I thought of it with that plumbing fitting and that, you know, this, in, and I'm sure plenty of you guys have heard it, but I've used this, this analogy so many times. But I'm just going to do it real quick for you guys. I had this fitting that was on my shelf. I work at a retail store, so a retail hardware store. And we had this little rubber coupling with two hose clamps on each end of it. It's a very common pipe fitting for joining, like, a cast iron pipe to a plastic pipe. It's a very simple product maybe $10, right? Well, this thing came up in short supply like everything else out there, right? And we didn't have any on the shelf for a few weeks. Well, the people who do like excavation work or septic systems and stuff, they are in they are in major need of this thing to, to do their work. And they are holding up $10,000 because of a little $10 part. So what ends up happening is, is that once this part makes it to the, to the shelf, they run out there and they grab all of it, right? And I tell them, it's just like, you know, I got more in the warehouse. I can get more. Don't worry about buying it all up. I mean, I can, you just need the one or two, right? They're like, no, but we're not going to be out of stock on this thing again. I'm never going to hold up one of my projects because I can't get a $10 part. They're all coming with me. Well, the next guy who comes in looking for that can't find it. But then when the comes on the show, he does the same thing. These are panic buys. They don't really want that much. Well, the computer algorithms that supply the the stores or the warehouses, when they see that there is a constant inventory depletion, like they're always needing to order more, they start ramping up their orders in order to fulfill the demand that is happening out there. But they don't realize that it was a panic buy. They don't need that much. But there's no like person out there saying, hey, wait, hold on, adjust that computer algorithm back down to what it was. The people who are buying this stuff just did it out of a panic purchase. They don't really need that many. And if we manufacture all this stuff, we're going to end up with too much. There's nobody out there who does that. So as these orders start coming in saying, man, we got a lot of demand for these damn plumbing fittings. Who knew, right? Well, that starts going through all the stores, goes through all the distribution hubs, goes throughout the, all the you know warehouses and all the way up to the manufacturer who is going... Oh my God, there's this overwhelming consumer demand. Start ramping up production, right? Start ramping up manufacturing, you know? And then all of a sudden, here comes the flood of stuff and it hits the shelves and the guys just need the one, you know? Thank you, right? We don't need all this stuff. That's what we're experiencing. That's the bullwhip effect. In order to have something like that happen in silver, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know how that would work. Like you would have to all of a sudden have everybody run out there and grab silver and demand for silver go up and then you would have the few miners that produce mainly silver go for it most of silver is a byproduct of like gold or copper or nickel mining or something so it's not even like really something that could even ramp production up on i mean i guess there's a you know if you the price goes high enough then you could but 
it's not like something that I think would be exposed to like that bullwhip effect in the same fashion. I don't know. I could be wrong on that, but that's kind of the way I see it. All right, thank you very much for the four ninety nine there, Genie. Thank you very much. Silver runs with lead. Oh yeah, right. Uh, lead mining, and isn't it like? I mean, if I got it right, silver is like pretty much a byproduct of other metals, right? It's like there's very few actual silver mines that add like major inventory to the market. It's mostly from the byproduct. All right. Does it make you uncomfortable that the mainstream news is also talking about recession nonstop? Does that make me uncomfortable? No. It finally leads me to believe that people are starting to be exposed to the reality of the situation. I mean, if it wasn't for the unusual and exigent circumstances of the pandemic, we would have been in a full-blown like economic collapse crisis right now. But they have the unusual and exigent circumstance in order to you know, produce the special purpose vehicles and to do the stimulus and quantitative easings and all the other stuff. And if they didn't have that, then there would have been no excuse. You think about it, like bailing out corporations is like politically, like it's like a political suicide, right? People hate the idea of bailing out corporations. But if you're in the middle of a pandemic and you have the unusual and exigent circumstance of the, of the, of the COVID and you can set up the special purpose vehicle, well, now you can fund that special purpose vehicle with hundreds of billions of dollars and then put out the news media that you're going to be buying corporate debt. People will flip out, run out there and try and front run the Fed and buy up all the corporate debt. Guess what? Corporations got completely funded by the people, by the markets. The, cor the Federal Reserve hardly had to do anything at all. It was the free market that did it off the perception that the Federal Reserve was going to be participating. But... They didn't do anything. They didn't, they, again, they sat on their hands and did nothing but give out a bunch of job boning. I mean, they bought a little bit of corporate debt, but that was just to establish the credible threat. That's it. And then when they shut that special purpose vehicle down, all that money went back to the, went back to the treasury and the Fed and all that. They just, you know, they got rid of it. They only used, if I remember right, they, they funded that thing with $75 billion and then leveraged it up to $650 billion, however they did that. So. Uh, okay. uh, yes, depression unfolding from the inflation. No. Um, it's It's not. Like, I don't see it that way. I see... Manufacturers right now are going to slow down because there's so much stuff in inventory right now. There is going to be hardly anybody buying it because they're not going to be using credit because credit's too expensive. So the cost of money is up. They're not going to be buying all this stuff on credit. I said that a long time ago, too. I said they're not going to let you buy all this stuff with cheap credit, right? They're going to raise the interest rates on it. So all this stuff is out there. Manufacturers don't need to be manufacturing into a over swelled inventory levels. Those guys are going to go out of business, I mean, or a lot of them will. That's going to be the real problem. Those are the jobs. I mean, think about the Cantillon effect. Think think about, like, what's happening, what would happen, you know, back in the day if manufacturers start to slow down or start to, you know, to go away. What's up, bud? I'm going to come back in. You want to jump back in? All right. Yeah, we'll give it another 10 minutes out here. I think these guys are getting bored. All right, we got another super chat. Let's see what that one says. The mainstream media now talks, oops, now talks nonstop about recession and, oops, and housing correction. Doesn't a part of you wonder if the opposite will happen? Um, I still, I, I'm still having a, I, again, I don't want to call out the housing market because, I was convinced on the housing market prior to the pandemic, you know, but the papering over of it just, I mean, I was just like, well, you know, I guess you can't call the housing market if they're going to do stuff like that. Right. I mean, think about it. Any time in history, have they ever told people to not make their house payment and you don't have to pay rent and you're not going to get booted? I mean, that's, that's like, who, who would have thought that would have happened? Right. I mean, that's crazy. So, um, but the recession, I mean, that that was pretty obvious. Like, 
that should have happened a long time ago. They shouldn't have had the pandemic, right? They, they, I mean, well, they shouldn't have had the unusual and exigent circumstance, so we should have already had a recession. But since they went ahead and just like created all these created a situation in which there was an intense amount of jobs. Now you can have a recession where people don't really go in unemployment. Have you ever had that before? I mean, that's pretty unusual, right? To have a recession without the unemployment could happen. All right. We're going to give it another 10 minutes, Freddie, and then we'll go home. How's that sound? Okay. Okay. Any good rock throwing in that river? What do you think, Freddie? Do you like throwing rocks out there? I didn't throw rocks out there. You didn't? Did you smash any? Yeah, um, so there's a tree that fell down over there, yeah. and then I grabbed this big stone, threw it off, and it broke into two plates, and then I dropped one on top of the other, and then, um, it came on, it came out in, like, a knife form, and I did that a lot, a lot of times, till I actually got one. I dropped it, um, but I do know where it is. Yeah, so it had a real sharp edge, like a knife? Yeah, I was, I was sharpening it. Yeah, did you chop any wood with it? No. No. I, I didn't think about that. You did. <laughs> he loves yeah. smashing these rocks when you drop them out here. They shatter into like these little, really sharp edge pieces, and then you'll use it to carve on wood and stuff oh, like that. Remember it's that? It's actually kind of a survival and survival thing. I mean, if you ever need a sharp edge, even I mean, it's a stone, but it's still sharp enough it'll cut you. Come oh. out here to the river, smash those things up, and you can make yourself a knife, huh? Yeah, and. Remember the first time I did it where it went perfect? Mm-hmm. It was, it was yeah, real thin. Uh, I didn't, like, throw it over the bridge. I threw it off of the bridge, or tree, fallen you, tree. Yeah. I was, I was on it, and I walked all the way across it. Yeah. You remember when you found that fossil? You remember it had the little, oh, like, yeah. the little clam we, on it or we, whatever? We don't know if it's actually a fossil or yeah. it's just a rock. If it's just, it looks like a little, it, like a little tiny clam on the edge of this rock. I don't know if it just happened to be part of the formation of the rock, but it looks to me like a fossil. I mean, that's what I thought it was when I first saw it. All right. hundred dollars so far. Yeah. Aren't they, aren't, isn't everybody so generous? They're so nice to, I mean... They're very supportive, and they, I don't know what to say. I mean, they're just, they're awesome people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they like you to have ice cream, because they mentioned it a couple of times, so I guess that's what we get to do. Wait, how many times? A couple. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everyone who isn't a government affiliate does skip the dishes and fast food jobs in Nigeria. Everyone who isn't a government affiliate does skip the dishes and fast food. Yeah, I'm, uh, sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Dad's a smart guy. Deserves it. Well, thank you very much. You guys are so awesome. You want to find a comment or something? Sure. Yeah, go ahead and find one. In there. One Lily just says Niagara Falls. <laughs> and one just says Niagara. No, oh, oh, I think they were trying to say Ni I said Nigeria. They were meaning Niagara Falls. Um, All right. Oh, there's a five. Oh, is that the one that we already done? Yeah. All right. Go find. I want to find one of the more recent ones. Hit that little blue arrow. Or I can just oh, okay. pay, pay cash for it, for a house or twenty percent down and mortgage the rest. Yeah. Um. Well, I had to on our house when when we went to go purchase it. I had a foreclosure in my past in the last five years, and and that's off my off my record now, but. At the time, I still had it. It was still within the last five years for the final of the foreclosure. And I had very few loans that were available to me. And the ones that I did have available to me were oh. like 10% down. And that took a lot out of me. But now the price of the home or the value, the I don't know about value, price, whatever. Now the home is estimated at like almost $100,000 more than what I had paid for it. And that just like, it blows me away that it's that much higher. And now, like, I have way over, well, I don't know, probably 25% equity in the house. So, oh, lost well, no, there we go. So I don't know if I could actually go underwater unless it's, like, significant. What was oh, that yeah. question? She is happy for us. Thanks for letting me in. Hey, thank you very much. Ghost, is that Stallone? Is that what that says? Ghost. Yep, yeah, ghost. Thank you very much, ghost. Oh my god, how long you been 
live. I've been live for, let's see, on the stream An for... Hour, an hour, almost two hours, basically almost. two hours. Yeah. Almost. almost. Like, so close to 100 subs. Yeah. You know, I... No, I was going to... Never mind. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I've never asked for subs, and I've rarely ask for you guys to like the videos the only time i ever ask you guys to like the videos is during these live streams so that we can get more people into the chat but i've never asked for a sub not once i've thanked you guys i've i thank you guys all the time for for subbing to the channel but i figured that if you truly appreciated the channel you would sub you would subscribe to it and if the video was a good video you would like it on your own so i never asked for any of those things and I think that's actually been a benefit to my channel because it gives me a really good base. You guys are my like the base of this channel. And I'm not out there looking for people who don't want to be here. I'm looking for people who want to be here. And that's what that's what I have. And that's why my channel means so much to me. It's because you you truly want to be here. And I can't again, I can't thank you guys enough for that. you I mean you changed my life. You're definitely making Freddie's life a better one. I don't Oh, ten dollars. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, what's the question there, Freddie? Bring oh. it back down and look what the question is. No one but the West is on this constantly green touching and climate Argentina uh, agenda. Agenda. I believe the ultimate goal is to lower the life studs and salaries so they can become competitive in production again. In your opinion. So let's read that one more time. It says, uh, no one but the West is on this costly green tech climate agenda. I believe the ultimate goal is to lower the life standard and salary so they can become more competitive in production again. Your opinion. Well, now that's an interesting thought. Now, I hadn't really thought of thought in that way before so I'm gonna have to roll that over a little bit but that's kind of interesting to think about because so many jobs are being exported or moving over because of the you know the foreign trade coming in and decreasing the local manufacturing here so there's got to be something or else right I mean or else we'll pay the consequences but there's got to be something out there that that uh that needs to happen in order to to stimulate the economy again and to create that manufacturing and jobs manufacturing base kind of thing. Like there's gotta be something out there to do that. And if it's the green energy that is pushed to make that happen, that could be a way to do it. Now, again, I not I'm not a like a believer or fan or anything in one direction or the other. Like I'm pretty agnostic to all that stuff. I just like try to look at things the way they are and what's happening and try to, you know, condition myself so that I can be in the best position while that has taken place but that's an interesting thought now i'm going to roll that one over a little bit and try and figure it out wonder what the 100k plaque weighs do you know um, so i only know i'm pretty sure the diamond i only know about the diamond and how much that weighs how much does the diamond one weigh i'm pretty sure like five pounds five pounds i bet you the other one's probably not too far from that um, okay Go ahead and read another question there. Uh, I will never understand why some folks have solar and wind power. I have been thinking about this tech since I was a kid. It's a no-brainer to use the sun and wind to create power. Mm -hmm. Well, that is that is a no-brainer. The only, the only drawback that I find to it is that, so you buy all these solar panels, you put them on your roof, it costs you an arm and a leg to do it, but then you have like free power, right? You don't have to pay for your power anymore, you got this free power that's coming. How long does it take to pay for the solar panels? And then by the time you do, are they wore out? Do you need to get more solar panels? Did you save any money doing that? I mean, you can become self-sufficient, which is an excellent position to be in, but that's a different that's a different kind of idea. Like buying solar panels to save money or something like that. I don't I don't know if that's actually the case. I don't know if that'll happen. But to be self-sustaining is totally totally understandable, you know. Um go ahead and read another question there, Fred. Uh it's it's better to lease the solar than to buy um, um in in my opinion. I, 
That's what that oh. yeah, it's, it means in my opinion. Um, well, then that kind of makes sense because then you could lease it probably cheaper than the electricity cost. Is that kind of the idea behind that? And if that's the case, then yeah, then you got two things going on. You got first the self-sustainment of it, and then you get it cheaper. So yeah, that might actually be the better way to go. Um, unfortunately, that kind of falls into the you'll own nothing and be happy kind of thing, but whatever. I mean, <laughs> you're taking advantage of it. Go ahead and grab another question there, bud. Okay. We got, let's give it two more questions here, and then we're gonna, we're gonna head home. Okay. Uh, just wait till more people get solar panels, then government step in with taxes, maybe a sun tax. Maybe. Oh, yeah. So you get all this, you start taking advantage of the cheap energy that you get from the sun, and then all of a sudden the government comes in and says, hey, because you're getting all this stuff for free and we're not getting anything out of it, we're going to charge you for getting stuff for free. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's totally government for then, you. Then We're, it's not free. And then it's not free, right? Yeah, that's government for you. All right, let's grab one more, and then we're gonna we're gonna head. Let, home. Let's do one that's kind of far up. You two you want, hours so far. You want to go back a little ways? Okay. Uh, how about like somewhere here? Okay. How about hydrating food or? It's freeze, food. He's trying to write food. Oh, food or please drying. It instead of canning yeah absolutely that is a wonderful way of preserving food and um, I used to do dehydrating like I would dehydrate mushrooms and and because around here in the Pacific Northwest I mean mushrooms pop up in the fall like crazy so my wife and I we would go out and get chanterelles and we would dehydrate those and we would have bags of dried chanterelles that we would add to soups and mixes and stuff like that so um, I have done that in the past I I mean, it is definitely a great way to go about preserving food for the, for the future. Um, I just, I guess maybe it's because I haven't got a lot of experience with consuming dehydrated food, like actually using it. It's not really in my like arsenal of ideas to try and preserve food. I know canning. I mean, I, I around here, everybody does it. We all know it really well. Um, but yeah, there's no, I mean, that was definitely, I mean, freeze drying food is certainly a great way to go about preserving food for the future. So, all right, let's go down and read the very, very last one and then we're going to go. Okay. Very last. Yeah. All the way to, yeah. Hit the blue and, and see what it is. Oh, oh it was a, yeah. I see it was a super but sticker. You mean like that? Well, yeah. Cause he, oops. Oh, yeah. ask Freddy if most of all to make sense or don't make sense. Um, Kind of. <laughs> well, who makes... Let's see here. Um, I guess you probably, like... I mean, we probably have to direct that question a little bit more. Like, does... Do you think adults know much about economics or the economy? People at the Rebel Capitalist do. Yeah, and the people at the Rebel Capitalist definitely know a lot about it. Yeah. All righty. I think we're probably ready to go. Looks like uh, Freddie's big brother's ready to go. Max standing over there, like in front of the car, with his with his lunch, like in his hands, the garbage from his lunch. So I All think right. he's ready to go. Turn it off with that. Um, Devin. let's see. When are we going to see you and George Gammon in your car? That's a funny one. I, you know, um, actually, I have. Um, I have plans to have Jason Hartman on the show, and he is like really wanting me to take a picture of the car going this direction so it's actually looking at me and then I'm going to sit in my car with the camera going and he's going to impose that background and he's going to sit like he's sitting in the passenger seat and we're going to do like a conversation so it looks like we're sitting in the car um, anyway I don't know how well that's going to work out but we're going to try that out car studio is the best it sure is all right, guys, uh, these guys are getting bored, and I know it's probably getting close to the time that we're going to have to start making dinner or something here, getting prepared for that. Um, what what time is it? I don't know. Uneducated economist. You guys let me know. It's 4 o'clock. Go ahead and hit it.